One of the most enduring legacies of Ellen Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables is the notion of kindred spirits. In fact, early readers employed the term with such frequency that within months of publication, the author bemoaned ever having used it. Still, fans across the decades and around the globe continue to embrace the idea of a community of like-minded people, even though they cannot see them. Today, I will discuss kindred spirits as an imagined community, as defined by Benedict Anderson's theory of nationalism. In contrast to the monarchic kingdoms of yore, such communities are socially constructed by those who envision and accept themselves as part of a group thus increasing agency among non-elites. Community members use a common language that's unique to them, and mass media share texts and contribute to the awareness of others simultaneously reading those texts, even when they are strangers. Today, I will consider how Anne's consumption, discussion, and adaptation of the literary canon and popular genres, her word choice and language, and her understanding of unseen kindred spirits waiting to be discovered are representative of an imagined community. I will also look at how these elements serve as a model for readers to envision their own such community in physical and virtual realms. Political scientist Benedict Anderson defines the nation as an imagined community and identifies its three cultural roots. First, the dwindling belief in kingdoms that revolved around high centers, or monarchs ruling by divine right. A new understanding of temporality that exchanged sacred time for what Anderson describes as homogeneous empty time, measured by clock and calendar. And finally, the fall of sacred languages, previously considered the gateway to truth, and the subsequent rise of a common language specific to a group. Together, these elements establish the foundation for envisioning the nation as a group of individuals joined through a common vernacular and history. These same cultural roots can be applied to a variety of imagined communities, including that of kindred spirits. We all know a kindred spirit when we find one. I suspect every Anne aficionado could share a story about having a kindred spirit as a bosom friend or stumbling serendipitously upon one among strangers. Although the term certainly exists outside the context of Anne of Green Gables, there are probably more than a few who would insist that its truest meaning can only be reserved for those who use it with intentional reference to Anne. Why is that though? And exactly what does it mean to be one? How do we know when someone belongs to this community or if they don't? The answer is in the way that Anne imagines kindred spirits as a community, and by extension, the way she teaches us to imagine it. The notion of kindred spirits is predicated on the understanding of an unseen community of which Anne is entirely certain. She's always attuned to the possibility of discovering another one. Kindred spirits are Anne's in-group, her crowd, they're not the elite, not the richest or the prettiest or of royal or noble blood. They're not simply nice people either, such as Loretta Bradley or Superintendent Bell when he visits Anne during her convalescence. They're not even always apparent at first glance, as in the case of Miss Josephine Berry, who doesn't look very much like a kindred spirit, according to Anne, and whose rightful place in the community Anne waits to confirm. The stuff of kindred spirits, then, is intangible, yet very real. The nature of Anne's selective imagined community of kindred spirits gives agency to her, a heroine of the lowest echelons of society, an orphan girl and outsider. Now let's consider how Anne's vision of kindred spirits entails the three elements Anderson points to as the cultural foundation of the imagined community. For Anderson, the decline of high centers marks the movement away from a monarchical society in which all aspects of the kingdom revolve around royalty who reign by divine right. Such fragmentation and disintegration allow new groups to imagine themselves as a socially constructed community. In Anne of Green Gables, we find a main character who is far from society's high center of that time. She's an orphan, a child who, as Barry Duty and Duty Jones observe, is without, quote, a proper social identity, for this is supplied by family, end quote. 
Additionally, these authors note that she is a girl at a time when, quote, not being a boy is a defect as culturally perceived, end quote. This othering of the main character sets her apart to imagine her very own community. For the orphaned Anne Shirley, the family as community is her greatest dream. It marks the high center or pinnacle of belonging. Orphaned within months of her birth, Anne has been taken in by families to work and is just as easily handed off when they no longer need or want her. Despite these imperfect examples of family life, Anne envisions belonging to a family and a community of friends, thanks to her reading and imagination. Anne is confident of the existence of a community of like-minded people, in spite of the evidence her loveless, loveless life has shown her. Just as she sees Katie Maurice in the bookcase or hears Violetta in the echo, Anne knows there are others with whom she can connect on a deeper level, even if she does not see them. These are not imaginary friends. They are real people. They just need to be discovered. Anne's dream of belonging is made a reality when she leaves the orphan asylum to live with the Cuthberts. She articulates this within moments of meeting Matthew at the train station when she says, what seems so wonderful that I'm going to live with and belong to you? I've never belonged to anybody, not really. When Anne learns that the Cuthberts intended to adopt a boy, she is heartbroken at being cast away from the family community and says, you don't want me because I'm not a boy. Nobody ever did want me. Despite the mistake, Anne has quickly won over the quiet Matthew in whom she sees a kindred spirit. Quote, I felt he was a kindred spirit as soon as ever I saw him, end quote. Marilla ultimately agrees to keep Anne and the little girl immediately tries to invest her new relationship with family ties. I'd love to call you Aunt Marilla. I've never had an aunt or any relation at all, not even a grandmother. It would make me feel as if I really belonged to you, she says. Anne still identifies with the outsider at this time, and she sees herself in the little girl in the chromo of Christ blessing little children, who stands apart from the group or high center. Once Anne's family community is assured, she hopes to fulfill her second dream of belonging, finding a bosom friend. Further explanation of this term being required from Marilla, Anne specifies, quote, an intimate friend, you know, a really kindred spirit to whom I can confide my inmost soul. I've dreamed of meeting her all my life, end quote. This observation about dreaming or imagining a really kindred spirit highlights Anne's utmost faith in such people, despite her own disadvantaged life vis-a-vis -vis her society's high centers, even if she hasn't met these people yet. The envisioning of synchronous activities also lends itself to this process of imagining communities. As sacred time was replaced by linear time, measured by clock and calendar, print media bearing a date contributed to a sense of group simultaneity. Newspaper reading is thus a type of rite that, according to Anderson, is performed in silent privacy in the lair of the skull. Yet each communicant is well aware that the ceremony he performs is being replicated simultaneously by thousands or millions of others, of whose existence he is confident, yet of whose identity he has not the slightest notion." End quote. Anne Shirley's print world is comprised of a variety of texts that function in the same way. She is intimately aware that others are reading these same texts too, even when she cannot see them. Novels, poetry, magazine, newspapers, and school readers all inform Anne's vision of the world and its possibilities. As an outsider without a community of family and friends, Anne's reality and understanding of others are profoundly shaped by what she reads. Anne repeatedly references books and readings to explain her experiences. She explains everything from a lifelong sorrow to being in her her life being a perfect graveyard of buried hopes and wonders whether a rose would smell as sweet if it was called a thistle or a stump cabbage, all with references to reading. Anne's knowledge of the fashions of the time, such as puff sleeves, is informed by periodicals. When we consider that Anne was an orphan, we realize these books and magazines were not her own, but rather she borrowed them and they passed through others' hands. This sharing of text foments a sense of commonality. The ties between reading and friendship in the novel are clear. When the reader first sees Diana, quote, she was sitting on the sofa reading a book, end quote. 
Anne's relationship with bosom friend and kindred spirit, Diana, is interlaced with reading and shared reading. She selects the name Willowmere out of a book that Diana lends her, and Lover's Lane comes from a shared text too. Their other friends also share books, such as the popular Pansy series, and the little girls read them aloud together during dinner. They regularly exchange books among themselves and eventually write and share their own tales as members of the story club. As Anderson notes in his example of newspapers, physically seeing another read the same text corroborates the imagined community one has envisioned. Both this concrete proof and the omnipresence of text in Anne's life contribute to her awareness of others reading those same texts, even if she does not know them. The decline of sacred languages that served as the glue for social groups gave rise to a plurality of languages, each of which becomes the common vernacular of a particular group. This shared language is paramount for the very definition of a group, as Anderson notes, for, quote, the nation was conceived in language, not in blood, and one could be invited into the imagined community, end quote. A shared vernacular, in turn, fosters understanding and trust among group members. As we have seen, Anne's immersion in a variety of texts and media informs her view of the world and in turn her language. Hers is the language of romance, drama, and intertextual quotations and illusions, as we have seen in her very particular speech. Anne's word choice is intentional and she uses language with the assumption that others will understand her, although that's not always the case. When Anne first describes Matthew as a kindred spirit, Marilla has no idea what she means. You're both queer enough, if that's what you mean by kindred spirits, is Marilla's reply. A similar breakdown in communication occurs when Anne shares her dream of a bosom friend with Marilla. Later, however, Marilla begins to be absorbed by Anne's language, using it to inquire herself, quote, well, did you find Diana a kindred spirit? Anne's language draws others into her linguistic circle. Cynthia Striggers identifies how other characters begin to use, quote, her imagined names for things, and they become part of the geography of the narrated texts." End quote. Anne's descriptors of events as romantic or unromantic populate others' lives, and it is Matthew, her first kindred spirit in Avonlea, who advises Anne not to divest her life entirely of romance following her failed portrayal of Elaine. This common language, although adopted from Anne, was part of her imagined community of kindred spirits before she came to Avonlea. And as Gruz, Wellman, and Taktiev point out in their study of Twitter, it demonstrates how language becomes, quote, a key element of community formation, end quote. Reader's identification with the kindred spirit community was instantaneous. In fact, Montgomery writes in a September 10, 1908 letter to Ephraim Weber, quote, I wish I'd never written about kindred spirits in my book. Every freak who has written to me about it claims to be a kindred spirit." End quote. But why is this sense of identif identification so immediate and visceral? It is because the same elements that serve as the foundation for Anne's vision of kindred spirits, the decline of high centers, a sense of reading simultaneity, and a common language, inform our own imagined community of them. Montgomery's redheaded female orphan challenges her society's high centers, that is, its preferential treatment of boys and those with family names and inheritance. The numerous references to reading and literary allusions in the novel underscore the act of reading in general, and by extension, of reading Anne of Green Gables as a type of ceremony itself. Just like Anderson's newspaper reader, Anne's kindred spirit offspring are positive of the existence of others reading the same text. In fact, as Weber points out, Quote, this engaged way of reading is precisely what con constitutes the meaning of a kindred spirit, end quote. Anne's language seasons our own speak speech as we speak of scope for imagination, being in the depths of despair, describe something as tragical, or measure the romance of our own lives. We hear a reference to a broken slate, a tumbler full of raspberry cordial, or the Avery Scholarship, and we know in an instant that just as we have imagined it, we were never alone. Although the identification with and as a kindred spirit was instant, it continues well over a century after Anne's birth, especially with the advent of new media and computer-mediated communication. Virtual imagined communities of kindred spirits reinforce the group readers envision 
and enhance a sense of discovering a like-minded friend. This is much like Anderson's hypothetical newspaper reader, and as Steve Fox reminds us, quote, we can apply this same anonymous confidence to the millions of anonymous users who congregate and communicate with one another in the virtual world without ever knowing more than a screen name and a vague consciousness that they are congregating in a particular online space for similar reasons." End quote. A perusal of social media reveals a plethora of and related groups ranging from book clubs to fans of the books and fans of cinematic productions. Today, I will briefly discuss one of these communities to illustrate a virtual imagined community of kindred spirits. In March 2020, the members of the East Pointers Band were separated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Since they couldn't perform, they looked for a way to continue to connect with fans. Island native Cody Chasen discovered a copy of Anne of Green Gables in a box and decided he should read it aloud and one chapter per night on Facebook Live. And so was born Andemic, which expanded to include readers from among other musicians and festival organizers around the globe. The daily program brought viewers together from all corners of the earth, Canada, the USA, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, the UK, Japan, and many more. In fact, Andemic was so popular that the East Pointers responded to fans' request to continue with Anne of Avonlea, and later in a weekly format with Anne of the Island. Each evening, the East Pointers Facebook feed sent out notifications to followers who joined their live feed, their song Winter Green becoming an anthem for the show. A different reader shared a chapter per evening and often some music, and viewers used the comments feature to interact with the text as they heard it unfold and with each other. Following each broadcast, the East Pointers shared extensive show notes with further insights, explanations of regionalisms or other terms, references to festivals or locations from which readers had read, and so on. Readers and the production crew, or the Channel and News team, whose motto is stay classy, kindred spirits, emphasize they're not scholars, and many are reading Anne for the first time. This community reading and discussion of a classic piece of literature live on social media represents a decline of high centers, for no longer are such literary conversations limited to the halls of academia. Similarly, participation in a live broadcast contributes to understandings of simultaneity and by extension, community and belonging among what Siu, Ryu and Su describe as, quote, geographically dispersed viewers synchronized in time, end quote. When individuals participate in a regularly scheduled live stream program such as Andemic, they are aware of others who are viewing the same program at the same time. In fact, this is reiterated by the live counter at the top of the screen and the stream of reactions to and live comments on the feed. Finally, the endemic community has its own vernacular. According to Ray's study of Facebook groups, the language of social media solidifies a common group identity. Examples include hashtags, emojis, and abbreviations, as well as the unique expressions, word choice, jargon, or slang of different groups. For example, the endemic hashtag, a straw hat or green heart emoji, and inside jokes about the number of chickens sacrificed to the dinner table in Anne of Avonlea all form the linguistic makeup of the endemic community. And of course, members refer to themselves and each other as kindred spirits. Although an asynchronous outgrowth of the East Pointers endemic project, a related Facebook group allows members of the community, community to interact and share even more. Here, and related memes, photos from trips to Prince Edward Island, artwork, anecdotes, and even favorite recipes are shared among members who openly refer to their community as such between readings. At the end of each reading, readers reiterated the essence of this virtual imagined community with worldwide reach when they bid it, good night or good morning, kindred spirits. Anne Shirley's imagined community of kindred spirits arises from her unique set of circumstances. As an outcast, she is far from the privileged groups of her society. Her voracious appetite for books makes her aware of the existence of other readers, and they provide her and this community with a common language. Anne's example has served as a model for readers across the years as they envision their own community in physical and now in virtual realms. As Anne, we are always thrilled to discover that kindred spirits are not so scarce as we used to think, and it is indeed 
splendid to find out there are so many of them in the world.